Hello. Good morning or good afternoon. Good morning. Or good How afternoon, are you doing, Dan? Else. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How are you, Jess? Yeah, good, thanks. Nice to see we've got, uh, we've got a few people here already. Welcome. And thanks for joining. Yeah, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Cool. Um, I'm going to get right into it. Um, my name's Jess. I'm the product marketer here at uh, Metabase. Um, and we're joined today by Dan Volchernock from Reforge. Um, really lucky to have Dan presenting for us today. Um, so first, I will just go over the agenda again um, and cover a bit of what Dan will talk about. So we're going to hear about how Reforge organized their data based on their priorities and some of their data processes. The challenges that the Reforge team have faced while building out their data processes and what the Reforge team would like to do differently if they could start over again. And we'll also get a chance to look at some of those artifacts as well. So before we jump into it, I'll just cover a few housekeeping things. We have the chat box here uh, where we'd love to see your thoughts and comments as we go through everything. Um, but if you have a question, please make sure that you use the, the question box uh, just so we don't lose track of anything and we can cover your questions all at the end. Um, and we also have a react button here at the bottom panel. So throw in some emojis, get involved. Um, and we also have a few polls that are all ready to go. Um, make sure you go visit those and, and weigh in at some point during the chat. Um, but without further ado, I will hand it over to Dan to take us from here. All right. Thank you, Jess. Okay. All right. Thanks for joining everyone. I'm excited to chat about Metabase uh, and Reforge today. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Cambridge. Hope it's equally beautiful wherever you are. Okay. So a uh, little background on me. My name is Dan Walchenok. I have been at Reforge for almost five and a half years now. I joined when we had about five-ish employees. We've had a really interesting ride. We've raised about um, 80 or $90 million. I can't remember the exact number um, in our Series A and our Series B. Um, we offer uh, educational programs for uh, practitioners in tech. So product managers, people in data, designers, marketers, anyone building digital products today, we offer excellent courses. We think they're the best courses for anyone looking to level up their skills. Um, prior to Reforge, I worked at uh, management consulting, I worked at Microsoft, I got my MBA, and I started a company in business school. I sold it to HubSpot. Uh, I joined HubSpot in 2013, stayed there for five years. It was a really exciting ride at HubSpot. And then after that, I joined uh, uh, Reforge. Um, and now I've been here for about five and a half years. Um, so it's been a really interesting ride going from five-ish employees to we had about 180 at our peak last year. Uh, just like every other company, we've gone through some layoffs. So we're, we're, we're lower than that today. Um, but the company's doing great. And one of the things I'm really excited to sprinkle into this presentation today is a new product that, that I was involved in, in launching called Artifacts. And it's a way for people to showcase real examples of work. Think of it of like GitHub, um, but not for code, but for work that you do in your day-to-day -day job. So I have a couple of artifacts in today's presentation. I have a dashboard, a metabase dashboard as an artifact, as well as a schema diagram of the infrastructure tooling that, that that uh, we use here at Reforge. So um, if you haven't checked out Artifacts, love for you to go check it out. Let me know what you think. Uh, send me an email. I'm dan at reforge.com. OK, uh, now let's talk about, uh, ooh, I think Paris is the, is the place, Christoph. I agree. Um, I wish I was in Paris right now. Um, OK, so let's talk about Reforge's evolution with Metabase. OK, so when I arrived at Reforge, this is what people were doing. They were, uh, we we didn't have a BI tool. Uh, a product manager would go and make a request of an uh, engineer. The engineer would either send them a CSV or there was this, there's this feature in Heroku called Data Clips, I believe, and that would like automatically import data into a spreadsheet at some interval, maybe once, maybe maybe it would refresh. I can't remember exactly how it worked, but this was my world of uh, people would, 
get a data export, they put it in a spreadsheet and then send it out. And I kind of uh, like, I was like, oh no, this is not good. This is bad. And, you know, this is fine for early stage startup, but I just, I, I'd been at HubSpot for, for a while. Um, and I'd seen um, how a, we were like 2000 people when I left. And I'd seen how a big company really was trying to leverage its data really effectively to help drive the company. And so I was like, this is, this is not, uh, we are not going to keep going this way. <laughs> and as the, yeah, my title was head of data, head of product and data. I, I can't remember exactly what my title was, but basically data was under my purview. And I said, not on my watch, not anymore. And so at HubSpot, I had used Looker. And when I then going to Reforge, you could not have paid me to use Looker. <laughs> I said, hell no. Um, and so I was really excited to try out Metabase for many reasons. One, it felt like the right tool for what we needed. Um, and we, we used the open source free version to get started. And so I immediately tried it out and I immediately I loved it. And um, I, I can't tell you the team's reaction to just basic, basic stuff. Um, the idea of being able to run queries against production data and have it be always up to date. In the example I was sharing before, people would email a request to someone, the PM would go to the engineer, they'd write some SQL, they'd then dump it into a spreadsheet, then the PM would do some analysis in it, then they would respond to an email with you know, a chart, a, a, you know, a, like a pivot table or something like that. And when I showed them that it was really easy for anyone in the company to query our data and it was always up to date, they could have it automatically notify people, they lost their mind. They thought this was the most amazing thing. This is really cool. Uh, and this is no joke. This is this is a scene from our office um, from when I showed them Metabase. I don't know if anyone in the chat has had a similar experience to this. So this is a, this is a chart of our monthly active users using Metabase. So I'm using Metabase to look at our Metabase usage over time. So it's a little meta. Sorry, I'm looking at this question from Igor. Um, so the, we needed a way to visualize data inside the company. And so there were two main, I'll, 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 I'll talk about it in a later slide, but um, we, needed to be, we needed to be able to do basic reporting of how many applications have people, have people submitted to take our courses, What's the traffic to various sources on our website? Um, basic, basic questions. Whether it was, what are the, all the users that are based in New York? Or how many people have submitted applications to take our growth series course? We need to answer basic questions. Um, and oftentimes that data was either in a production database or it was in some sort of analytics the database. Um, and so those are the basic questions that people need be, needed to be able to answer and having up-to-date information um, was something that was always up-to-date um, and how anyone in the company could go in and build these simple reports themselves. This is, it doesn't take rocket science to say, I want a list of users and I want to filter on a column that's called location. And so these are like... Um, these are the types of things that we wanted to enable the team to be able to go do. Um, we didn't need a ton of fancy features. Um, I think, uh, you know, Looker's a, a great tool. There's a reason that Google bought them for, I don't even know how much, over a billion dollars, I'm sure. They had taught lots of enterprise features. We didn't need any of that when we were starting out. I know Metabase has some has a bunch of permission features as well, but Metabase felt like the right tool for us. Um, and it felt like it had a lot of room for us to scale into it. Um, and so from the functionality and pricing standpoint, it felt like a perfect match for what we were looking for. Igor, does that answer your question? Anyone else have any questions on that? I thought it was a, uh, that was a good one. Okay, I'm just gonna keep going. Oh, he's typing. Okay, great. Um, so you can see, um, we didn't, uh, for, for, the, for the first couple of years, we were plugging away, working hard. We didn't, we were not scaling the company that quickly. And so this was a perfect phase for us where Metabase was doing great for us. And we had not, we had less than 20 employees for a while while we were really working on the early versions of the company. 
Um, and what was in our initial setup? We had two databases that we hooked up in the metabase. We had our, our production read replica. So we didn't want to set it up to our actual production database. We didn't want any queries that I wrote or anyone else wrote to affect uh, our production app. And so these are things like user records, applications, payment records, or enrollments in our courses. These are the types of reporting that we wanted to be able to do. And then we also had a data warehouse that was populated by, by segment. Um, and that's things like backend server side events, email marketing data, um, um, and uh, clickstream data that was happening in our app. So these are the two data sources and we could query each of them independently to be able to do various different charts. And so for, you know, for years, it was basically just me toiling away, helping out various teams. Um, get the data that that they needed. And so this was a great, like it was fine for a single practitioner, but also scaling to many consumers of the data as well. So I, here's an, an artifact of, um, this is an actual Reforge dashboard that we used in the fall of 2020 to track one of our key things, our revenue. And so, this is taken, this is, I think this is a screenshot from actually recently, so it's well past the period, but this was the revenue that we collected in that period. We were looking at revenue over time relative to a, to a specific offset. Um, and we we're looking at the distribution of which courses people were taking. We we're looking at um, revenue year over year or semester over semester, that's this chart. This one shows the distribution of applications to various courses. This is an example of the type of dashboard that we set up and we enabled the whole company to go look at so they could understand how much revenue have we collected when we would talk about our goals and we would help people understand like like this obviously this chart is complete now but the um like as our periods were unfolding we could see where we were relative to um so like this blue series here was the spring of 2020 and this purple line was the fall of 2020. And so there was a period here where we were just above our spring performance. And you can see here, we really pulled away from the spring, um, you know, two weeks uh, after our big marketing push. And so these are the moments where we are really refreshing this dashboard constantly to understand how are we doing? How do we communicate that with the rest of the company? How do we make sure various teams have the right information they need so that we can adjust what we need to do, whether it's we should send out another email to this segment of people. We should work on the copy on this page because the conversion rate is low. Um, or this course is crushing it in terms of interest. This course is not. Um, I actually have a, it's like this is another chart on that dashboard, which broke, it broke down the cumulative number of applications for each of our courses. And you can see here, we actually stopped offering one of the options um, because it, it was we felt like it wasn't the right configuration. And so we just stopped doing that. And that's the reason the series ends. And we, um, you can see a lot of, there were a lot, of, a lot of interest in that, but we shifted it to the rest of our uh, uh, programs over time. And so we would use these charts to help marketing, to help product, to help lots of different teams adjust what they were doing in real time. Um, to, to, to help make sure that we uh, uh, hit our goals. And so we would also send, one of the things I love about Metabase, it's really easy to um, send, this, send this information into Slack. And so we would send in alerts to say, here's, here's our number of applications, here's our revenue, here are the visualizations over time. So we could really kind of infuse this information throughout the company. Okay. Oh yeah, here's another example of like it's, it's I was I was remarking on how little Slack has changed. This screenshot is from Slack in 2018. And you can see this is so this is the these are five-year-old charts from Metabase, right? This is what Metabase did five years ago in terms of its charts, and the charts have gotten a lot better. It was really nice to have spark lines to understand, like, okay, great, what are our weekly active users for this feature that we've launched and then killed? Um, and what's the trend over time? And so these are, these are the tools we had to really try and help Reforge become a data-driven company or a data-informed company um, across, the, uh, across the organization. 
So um, going back to here, after, we reached a point where we raised our Series A. We raised $20 million in venture capital, and we, uh, and we, 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 we made the conscious decision to invest in our ability to scale our programs and scale our uh, teams. And so we recognize that like one person doing a whole bunch of data work or, you know, on, on the order of one person doing data work was not going to be able to meet the demands of the organization as it scaled. And so we decided we, we need to hire a team and we need to formalize data within the company. So that's a bunch. Um, we hired a data engineer and we started to hire product analysts so that we could embed analysts within teams within the company. Uh, we migrated our data, our data warehouse from um, a Postgres data warehouse to Snowflake. We started to organize our data in schemas. Before it was just, we would pipe the data in from segment to the data warehouse and we just used the data as the engineering team set it up in our, in our production Postgres database. We decided to set up schemas in our data warehouse where we could organize data and so it was more easily consumed. You, didn't, you don't have to be a software engineer that knows the backend code to be able to stitch the, the, the uh, tables together. And we could denormalize tables, all that good stuff um, by organizing um, tables into schemas and really putting some thought into what should the tables look like in those schemas. In order to do that, we've leveraged DBT to put our complicated logic into uh, source control, but like whatever, there's lots of, you don't have to use DBT. I don't know if I'd make that the same decision today, um, but it was, it, one the maybe I'd re, I'd rename this heading from DBT to source control to put the logic of uh, our business into source control, so that we could make sure that we don't break things accidentally, but also get some visibility into if things break and what the dependencies are between things. Uh, oh yeah, the migration from Postgres to Snowflake. Um, we we started to build some fairly complicated uh, queries in Postgres and we could have invested in um, um, in becoming a little bit more experts in Postgres as well as like using DBT to create some, some intermediary tables and do uh, calculations. But Snowflake felt like a great move for us. But some of the, the reasons for us is that um, we, we're not, we're not Facebook. We don't have crazy amounts of data. And so the storage costs for Snowflake were, 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 quite, were quite low. And the usage data or the, the, the usage of um, Snowflake wasn't that high either. And so the cost from going from Postgres to Snowflake wasn't that much more. Definitely gone up over time. Um, but the idea of decoupling storage and compute was, was nice to us. There have been a couple of instances where, like, maybe it would have been fine to use something like a Redshift, um, where you're not penalized when you just do every query. Um, so it was more of just an issue of we know we we can't be on Postgres forever for a, for a, a data warehouse, and we don't want to get involved with sharding and upgrading our Postgres database over time. Snowflake felt like one of the leading players, and it was a lot of the tooling worked really nicely with with uh, S -S Snowflake. Um, and honestly, the, but the biggest thing was our queries were taking a long time to run in, in uh, Postgres. Um, the other, the other big thing is for a long time we had pain because we couldn't query across databases, and so we had our data warehouse in, post, in one Postgres database, and we had our production data in a Postgres read replica, and it's a pain to query between the two. And so one of the things we did is we. Um, we ETL data from our from our read replica into our data warehouse, so we could do analyses that where we could join between these um, two different data sources because the data was going to be in the same uh, of the same warehouse. Um, the other thing we did is we invested in an attribution tool. Um, and so I think, like, the, my, my big thing is I think we definitely improved a ton. Uh, we level up, we leveled up our skills and our infrastructure and everything else. I think the biggest thing that, that looking back on this as I was working on this was that I don't think we did enough to evangelize and document how it all worked and how to use it. Uh, I think it was all inside my head. 
um, and I, I did not do nearly enough to empower the engineers and the analysts on the team to understand how it all worked together. And then I think that cascaded to end users. And so um, I actually looked back and I found a presentation I did it in my second month at Reforge, and I showed very clear examples of um, uh, here's a request that came in from uh, from um, someone on an, in an operational role trying to run our courses. It went to a PM. The PM then emailed them back. And I showed a real example, and then I showed them the exact same analysis that anyone could do in Metabase with just a couple of clicks. I said, this is always up to date. We cut out a whole bunch of people asking questions, and it's always up to date. You never have to ask for it again. And so I'm kind of embarrassed because I, I, re I realized that we didn't, I didn't do nearly enough of that for all the new hires that we, that we brought onto the whole company of here's how to answer very basic questions. Um, um, just to get people started, as well as as we added new things, how to um, just how to go about using it. Um, and just I like, it just, we went from one person and two simple databases to a lot of complexity. And so I actually I have another artifact that shows our infrastructure diagram. And it just, it, it um, this is a lot for anyone to come up to speed on. You know, the, we had lots of different types of traffic. We had lots of different first party data sources, whether it's our um, Stripe, whether it's our web app, it's our marketing website, it's our customer support tool, our email marketing tool, all of these things were data sources that got fed into either our CDP segment or directly into our data warehouse. And so Metabase is our BI tool at the bottom. And it's just really hard for, I think, people to understand all of the different first party data, the first party data sources, how it all flows through the system, what, how, how frequently this data is reset is refreshed, how it's all brought together, and then the tables that you can use to query this uh, uh, this data. And so, I actually waited way far too long to just create this diagram. I think for uh, for my team, and so I don't think everyone on the team had a good sense of this. And then if 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 the, if the data team doesn't understand this well enough, I don't think your end users are going to be going to understand it. Um, either because your team isn't going to be really equipped to answer all these questions. Um, cool. And then this this is <laughs> this is our DAG in DBT, and so you can just see it got really complicated. All of the models that we built. Um, and I think one of the big learnings that I took away from this is this is really complicated for anyone to understand, let alone on the data team, but as well as if you're just, if you're someone on the support team, if you're a product manager, if you're someone in marketing, if you're in customer success, what are the five models you really need to know about? How do I go about querying them? And, um, what are the ways in which I can slice and dice them or, or aggregate them? <clears throat> Um, and so I think it, it went from this, like, wow, this is amazing. This is really cool. This is answering a lot of our questions. One person is the source of a lot of the knowledge we can go ask him to how do we scale that knowledge to many people? And I think we did a reasonably good job, but looking back, I, I see lots of room for improvement, um, what we could have done. So like, you know, just like basic stuff, like I would have held a new, I would have had a monthly session for all people new to the company. Um, as well as anyone else who wanted to join of like, here's how to do basic queries. Here's the model that is our users. So if you want to find all the users in uh, New York City, boom, here you go. If you want to find all the people that took this course, here are all the people that submitted a customer success request. These were all things that we had readily available, but I don't think we showed people how to do it nearly enough. Um, the other thing, I think you can you can tell from our DAG here, we had all, so many models. We had so many that were exposed to people in Metabase or other tools, but I would have picked five or maybe three. Uh, it's like, obviously users one, you probably have some other, maybe it's companies to understand, like, especially if you're, B2B, you're, if a, you're a B2B product, you want to be able to aggregate to say, how many active users do I have from Reforge or from Metabase or from 
um, you know, GBT labs or whatever it is. Um, and then there's probably one other object that's specific to your business. For us, one of the things that we cared about was um, our, uh, our uh, courses. So how many applications did we get for courses? What is the enrollment in courses? What is the content completion rate on courses? So just having real a really simple model so that people could, whether it's on the user level or something else, so that people can understand, I want to analyze a program, this class, how is it done over time? And I just would have really tried to simplify that and leverage those in the in the training. So a model, sorry, a model is just a table. Um, like I want to be able to do select star from table. And so either I can write SQL against it to say count where users where and bucket it by the creation month. Um, yeah, I, yeah, sorry, I don't want, just, uh, it, 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 oh, oh, just sorry, Dan. Do you mind if I jump in there as well? Absolutely, go for it. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of expand on your point about models a little bit as well. Um, so basically, they're yeah, like you say, like tables, but they're managed by the admins. So you can bring together different columns, um, maybe from different data sources, and you can prioritize what information is in that model to make it easy for your end users to start asking questions. Yeah, yep. So so when I say prioritize a couple of models, uh, have a, a table. It could be a view, it could be a table, What you know, use whatever terminology you want, but like one spreadsheet equivalently um, that you have really good documentation for. Um, and you're really intentional about the um, the dimensions um, and the, the other metadata available uh, in in those models, um, and just try and make them really good. Um, you can see from our DAG, we too like we had a lot, and so I would just really make sure that you had a couple really killer ones you can leverage, and most of the analysis is done using those. Um, and to Jess's point, Metabase has a feature where you can have models where it's a you can point a model to a data mart table, you know, view whatever it is in your in your warehouse, and it's a lot easier to reuse models in arbitrary in custom SQL or in arbitrary questions in Metabase. And so um, that's a feature that didn't exist when we started using Metabase, but I would, and, but now we use it all the time in Metabase to just make it a lot easier to do reporting and help enable people. Um, things that I, I wouldn't do. I think, I think we, I think I did some, I, I peanut buttered my efforts in documentation across too many things. And I think I would have said, I want killer documentation for the user's table. That's all we care about right now. I just want this to be amazing. Um, and I think if I had really focused my efforts on a small piece of documentation and then expanded and then said, once this is great, I'm going to expand. It would have been better where, you know, we've documentation for how to use segment and our data dictionary and the different models and how to use metabase. We just had far too much documentation. I think if I had just focused in a couple, like one area at a time, would have been much better. Um, and I think, frankly, I tried to respond to everyone as I was trying to um, try to respond to everyone. And I think um, you got to just say, we're not going to respond to certain requests or we can't handle that and push people towards just make sure that 80% of the time you can answer their question with some of those base models. Um, whoops, this is a, so oh, just to just to circle back, let me go back to my previous chart here. Um, for a long time, it was just me. We hired a bunch of people to um, help. And you can see we we onboard a lot of people to the company. We've done we we've unfortunately had to do some some layoffs, so we don't have as many people. But another thing that I really that one thing that was really helpful for me as the person who felt responsible for leveraging data at the organization is I was tracking how much of the company was using Metabase. Um, there's nothing worse than putting all this effort into stuff and then no, no one using it. Um, and so I have a blog post. Well, I think we'll link to it in the in the page for this. But I would track. Um, I still get this today. You can see I got this three days ago. I get an alert that says how many dashboards I were created in the last seven days. The questions that were created. I, I even look at the um, who in the exec team, which dashboards they're using, and what they're looking at, and just what are the most popular dashboards as well as um, 
oh, sorry, who, who, which users are our power users and which dashboards are the, um, the power dashboards. And then this is old, my, uh, my old boss, but basically what's, what's my boss doing in Metabase? What is top of mind for him? Um, so that I can know what's, what's, what's important to him, what he's thinking about. And so just having a sense of how many people at the company are using the product as well as understanding who's doing what was something that I wish I had done earlier and was really helpful to understand like how plugged in is the company to what we're doing and are we is the investment that we're making paying off in terms of product improvements are we acting on the data and are but also are people even looking at this stuff and so that's one of the great things I love about metabase and these tools is you can really get great insight into are people using this tool at all and so um I haven't looked at this that I don't look at this that frequently, but it was a really helpful barometer for me to think like, wow, we have this 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 doesn't this chart doesn't have our count of employees over time, but you know just doing the math, this go this has anywhere from fifty to seventy I think over seventy five percent of our all employees were leveraging MetaBase on a monthly basis, and that felt. Um, I felt like that was a really good stat um, in, in, in terms of um, adoption at the at uh, Reforge. With that, love to turn it over to, to questions anyone has. So go for, I don't know where Jess is, but feel free to drop questions in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, so uh, uh, Christoph, why use a metabase model? Um, you, so um, you can do both. There's no reason that you can't do that with both. The thing that makes it really nice is that you can have, uh, it, the, the metabase model can just point to your materialized data mart in your data warehouse, but it makes the analysis of that data much easier in metabase and makes the reusability of that much easier as well. And so um, um, you, it's much easier to start questions. You can have lots of questions that leverage that model in Metabase. So it's more of a BI, um, uh, a BI, um, it, uh, at least from my perspective, it's, it really makes the, the reporting um, uh, usability much, much higher and the adoption higher than if you weren't to use the, the uh, Metabase model, uh, models. I'm sure Jess has some opinions on also why Metabase, the, why those features make it great as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if we touched on this before, but I think um, something that you referenced earlier was um, the metadata that you get with models as well. You can kind of give, give a bit more explanation and context about what's in, what, what people are looking at, which is really helpful for a lot of end users. It's just, it's just really, it's really helpful. Like you, naming things is really hard. I'm sure everyone on the call can, can I relate to that, but naming columns is really hard and it's really helpful when you can have the full documentation and all the context you need to have about what does this column really represent? Like, oh, there was a data issue or the data here starts at this time period. It's really helpful to have that documentation in your BI tool so that when people are looking at it, they can figure it out for themselves rather than either doing something wrong or then jumping over to Slack and asking a question that, that you don't wanna to have to answer 10,000 times. And so having that documentation in your model in Metabase um, is a, is a, is a big plus. Uh, good question with the data infrastructure diagram. Um, I think there's probably a whole bunch of other documentation that I didn't even get to. Um, I think that diagram isn't even that great, but I think it's all about what are you trying to address with that diagram? For me, the one I built was more, I was using it for marketing purposes. I was trying to hire a data engineer. And so I wanted a very high level overview. And I also wanted just, I wanted something to be able to point people to in the organization to say, this, these are the tools that we use. This is generally at a high level how they're connected. I think there's probably a bunch of much, uh, much lower level diagrams that you'd want to create that talk about how frequently the data is updated, um, caveats with the data, um, the you know, limitations of it, how it's how it's transformed and aggregated in various tables. 
all serving various teams. And so I would just think about what are the things that you need to do that are most important um, and create the documentation that addresses that. And again, it depends on whether it's for, the, for your data team, so your team knows what the heck is going on, or if it's for end users who want to be able to leverage it in any type of analysis. Um, I'm just going to jump us over to the questions tab now. I've seen there's a, there's a few coming in there as well. Um, Gordon's okay. asking, what metric was your hardest task to display and why? Um, I think one of the things that we struggled with was showing, there are probably two that were pains for us. One was content completion over time. It's just, uh, how do you showcase, how do you represent how much content a cohort of people have completed in a course? And so we would try things like, you know, what percentage of people have completed X percent of the material? And how does that change over time? So that was a challenging one. If you have any suggestions, let me know. Uh, another one was we were looking to, so we launched a subscription product. And so very different usage dynamics for a subscription product versus a one-time course. And so we wanted to look at the distribution of, of our people who are subscribed, how many days have they been active in the last uh, uh, 28 days and has that that distribution change over time and so we had a visualization we finally landed on that showed the percentage of our member base active for various time periods like let's say zero to five days five to ten ten to thirty uh, in the last 30 days and it was rolling and so each day it was a snapshot of the previous you know 28 days just to get a sense of who are our power users, is the power user shifting? How does that change as, as, co as courses start? These are all things that were mostly just hard to model in the SQL. And also just how do we visualize that in a compelling way with the amongst the, the, the visualization options that, that Metabase and any other BI tool has. Cool, I think uh, Gordon's next question is a, is a good kind of follow on from that. What's the biggest limitation of Medbase in your opinion, and how did you overcome that? And don't let me stand in the way here. <laughs> um, I don't, I, um, I'm sure that there's some enterprise feature that someone wants that Meta Metabase doesn't have, but like, honestly, I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is like, can you get people to use the data? And that's the biggest issue. And um, so like, that's the thing that I'm more focused on is like, how do you get people to ask more questions? How do you get people to answer their own questions? How do you get people to help other people? And oftentimes that's not, that's not a limitation of MetaBase. That's a cultural, that's a people thing. And so sure, there's some feature MetaBase doesn't have that some other enterprise, that, that a higher up enterprise, more expensive tool has. Um, but like, I don't think, at least for us, that's not even anywhere on my roadmap of complaints of things that that um, that Metabase has. One one little gripe. I, I don't want to. I don't want to totally just come off as someone who only has nice things to say. One thing that drives me a little nuts is the email. The the when Metabase sends you charts over email, the it doesn't always format it correctly as you would see in your browser. It's gotten better over time. I have a couple of charts that are just wild and crazy and that don't get formatted nicely. Um, so that's my, like, that's one of my complaints um, that drives me nuts on a semi-frequent basis, but like, that's a, you know, it's like a, not a big deal at all. So if, you know, at gunpoint, that's the thing I would say, but like, I'm not too, uh, there's no perfect solution. Every tool has its, has its rough edges. Nice deck. We'll invite you back. Um, <laughs> I guess related to that as well, um, Margaret's asking, uh, when you provide formal training to your new hires uh, to adopt Metabase, oh, sorry, do you provide formal training to new hires or does it happen organically? Um, so when I was at HubSpot, there was a, because the product was fairly complicated to learn, any new hire from any part of the company had to go through like a six week onboarding pro program where you, and mostly for sales and marketing, like learn how to sell it and all the features and competitive differences. But 
at least at least every employee went to at least a couple of days or a week of full of onboarding and training. That's a great thing that a big company like a HubSpot that had 500 to 2,000 people or 7,000 people now can afford to invest in someone's full-time job to focus on onboarding. Um, as a small scrappy startup, we we didn't have the resources to devote someone full-time to this. And so the thing that we did is we had a bunch of Notion docs that was, here's the company suggested onboarding, and then each manager would have an onboarding doc for each of their new hires. Um, and we would have we would tell everyone to link to a Notion doc that had a bunch of stuff for our for our training material. So it's like here's MetaBase, here's how you access it, here are the types of things available in it, here's a couple examples. Um, and I think just being realistic, I think this is the kind of thing that you'd want to hold a in person session on and show people um, how to use it, how to ask questions, the types of insights you can get, and make it compelling and interesting. And so that's the one thing I would do again, I would do differently, or one of the things I would do differently is I would hold live sessions, or I'd have someone on my team hold live sessions with a bunch of key interesting examples of doing real-time analysis that anyone at the company could could do. Um, I just want to piggyback on that question as well. Um, I was curious if um, the kind of meta, meta analytics uh, dashboards that you showed, did that inform your strategy for training at all? Uh, it didn't. Oh, I, so, sorry. I think if the adoption had been low, I would have said, oh, crap. <laughs> but the adoption was pretty high. And so I was fairly satisfied that 75% of the company was looking at a metabase dashboard on a monthly basis. Some people just don't want to, and that's fine. I'm not going to force you to look at charts. Uh, not everyone shares not everyone has a nickname like Data Dan, like I do at HubSpot and at, at ReForge. And so, um, you know, I would drop in lots of, I'm constantly dropping in examples, infusing every presentation with data and always linking to metabase dashboards in Slack or in, or in slides or everywhere else, everywhere else. So I made it easy for people to, like I wanted a slippery slide to get into metabase. Um, and so I felt like, I was actually pretty happy with the adoption usage usage amongst the whole company. But, you know, I I would also look at, if I felt like there were people who could leverage data, or there were opportunities to improve things, and I saw that they really weren't using Metabase, I would, wouldn't, I wouldn't come over and say, hey, I was stalking your Metabase usage. I'd come over and say, hey, is there anything I can help with? I, I have a couple of ideas. I don't know if you're open to them, but I was looking at Metabase and I saw X, Y, and Z. And so I could just kind of help them kind of dip their toe in the water if they were, if they'd forgotten about it or if they're a little apprehensive or just to open the door to conversations with individuals that I felt like should be using it that weren't. That, that's hard to scale to a larger, to a larger company, but at our scale, it wasn't, it, it, um, I was able to do that. Okay, next question uh, from Anastasios. I guess you have a lot of dashboards charts, metrics, et cetera. How do you keep a documentation of all of these and how do you use your data dictionary uh, like you mentioned in Notion with Metabase? Yeah, we, um, this has evolved over time. We have a bunch of different, um, we've, we, we've struggled with this. I feel like anytime you create documentation, it's always out of date immediately after you create it. Um, and so we definitely have a bunch of documentation in Notion. We have a data dictionary in a Google Sheet um, and then we try and also we use, um, we had a process where we would put document, documentation everywhere. We put documentation in DBT on our, 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 um, our tables. And then we would, that would then cascade down into Metabase either in the models or the documentation on tables. Um, so we tried to put documentation in as many places as we could, hopefully from a single source of truth. But to be honest, it was a, mess of documentation in Notion, Google Sheets, and also sometimes checked into source control associated with the models. And I know there are tools that do data uh, cataloging. Um, I just didn't think it was a big of enough, big enough of an issue um, to go invest in another tool for another thing that people had to go log into. And so uh, I've been begrudgingly okay with having documentation in a Google Sheet or just trying to get it into Metabase as much as possible in the models that we were talking about. 
Okay, I, like ultimately, I think you want your documentation in the tool that people are using. If people have to jump to another tool, whether it's in Notion or Google Sheet or in some other data cataloging product, they're just, they're just, I'm just, we should be realistic and they're just not going to do it. And so that's why I would push people to use models and put the documentation on the models for your key, key important models. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, next question is from Ahmed. Uh, if you have a lot of dashboards, a complicated situation can arise when you perform big updates in the data warehouse that involves changes of names of columns. Is there a way to automate this update to Metabase and the dashboards already created? That's a good question. Uh, it's a good question. This is another reason I would use models in Metabase is that um, it's a lot easier to update things if things are using the same model in Metabase. Um, so a big shout out to use models there. Another thing, another tool that we use is Metaplane, metaplane.dev. And they have a Metabase integration where they will tell you Anytime you have, like, let's say you have a PR in DBT, you want to understand the downstream implications of questions or dashboards, it will tell you that you're making a change that's going to affect the dashboard that your CEO looks at every day. So maybe, maybe you want to, maybe you want to make sure that dashboard is, um, uh, the changes are queued up so you can, as soon as that PR is merged and it runs, that it doesn't break that important dashboard. So shout out to one of my favorite companies, Metaplane, because they, they make that easier. Cool, we've got another culture question. Um, one of the challenges in my current organization is the fact that employees want answers without wanting to learn the data structures and how to do basic querying. Did you encounter that in your role and how did you overcome that challenge? Yeah, I think that's just human nature. People want answers without having to do the work. And so I think you want to, uh, you want to make it as easy as possible so that you can say to people, Oh, hey, here's here's how you or I think this is going to be less of an issue years from now, because I think all the, our AI overlord robots will make this a lot easier. In the meantime, I think you want some clear documentation that you can send people to, when they ask questions. You can say it's really easy. It takes three minutes. Look at this documentation. If you have if you have any questions or have issues, let me know. I'm happy to help. But like, look at the documentation first. And then I think you, what you want to the other thing you want to do is you want to find the people who are exhibiting the behavior that you want other people to copy, other people to copy, and you want to reward them and you want to hold them up as examples of people doing it in a great way. And I think people emulate behaviors that are rewarded and that are discussed. And so I think you want to shine a light on the people doing the things that you want other people to uh, copy. But it's, if you find the pill that solves this, let me know, because I'd be interested in buying it for everyone in my company. <laughs> yeah, I would also like to know. It's, uh, it's something that we hear a lot. Um, okay, I guess this next one's for me, cross data, any plans? Um, I'm afraid I don't know off the top of my head, um, but if you, we have a public roadmap. So if you want to go to metabase.com slash roadmap, um, you'll be able to see everything that's planned there. Um, which takes us to the end of our questions uh, tab. But I see there's been still a fair bit of chat going on in the in the chat box. Um, I can't quite remember where we got up to there, um, or if we have time to cover all this. I'm not sure if there's anything there, Dan, that kind of stood out to you that you wanted to pick up on. Um, let's see. How do you avoid situations where people create multiple reports or are inconsistent or conflicting? Um, this is where I think you want to try and force two buckets. There are things that are fairly straightforward that use data sources that are very difficult to misinterpret. And that's where you have a couple of your really basic models that are have like I don't know if people are bowlers here, but like like the like kid bumpers. So you like can't roll a gutter ball. Like you want to just make your models as easy to use as possible and in a way where someone can't come to some conclusion which is wrong, then they look bad, and then that makes the data team and the BI tool look bad as well. 
Um, so I think you want to try and avoid that by making the data as easy to report on and understand as possible. The other one is I think you want, for the people that are going to go very sophisticated analyses, you want to try and pair those people with, with some expert in your organization so that they can run things by those people. I think you want to split those because if you have everyone asking questions, you get into the situation from before where everyone doesn't want to do the work. But the people who do want to do the work and do a good sophisticated analysis, I think those are the people you want to help support and hold up as good, good examples. Um, you just want to make sure that those people who are willing to put in the effort actually are doing it right, using the right sources. And the last thing you want is those people that try really hard, come to an incorrect cl conclusion, put something out there, and then it looks bad for everyone. Um, so I think those are the two buckets that I would I would think about. Ooh, Catherine, I would, this is a prompt for chat GPT. I would think of, uh, I would just literally copy and paste. Like I want a nickname like Data Dan, but for Catherine, give me suggestions. I'm thinking Chatty Kathy, maybe. It's not perfect, but you know, it's a starting point. Someone should do that right now while we're on this chat and come and we should just vote on, on uh, Catherine's new nickname. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, so there are a few more questions in the um, in the chat. I think we've got maybe yeah a few more minutes. Um, yeah, I don't want to keep everyone too long. Um, um, plans to embed ChatGPT and MetaBase. Um, we don't have any solid plans for that yet, but it's something that we are looking at. Um, Wait, Jess, I, I saw there was some. You guys posted something. You posted some jar of like MetaBot where you could basically ask yeah. questions of models using, and uh, you could plug in your, op your open API key. Um, I haven't played with that myself, but that was something I was interested in. So that was, that was kind of cool to see that that's like currently that you could, that, that you come out that months ago. Um, so I'm yeah, excited to yeah, see that hopefully there. come into the roadmap somewhere. Yeah, you can play with it now. Um, I'm not sure where you can find that, but if you're interested, then um, we can, we can link to that um, at the end of this webinar as well. It was in a LinkedIn post. That's that's the only where I I actually was looking for it the other day, and you only yeah. do it from the LinkedIn post, I think. So, anyways, that's yeah, that's the only place I could cool. think of where we have it as well. Um, yeah, not sure. I don't think it's on the website. Um, oh, Ari has another good question about um, avoiding situations where people create multiple reports that are inconsistent or conflicting. Yeah. Um... I, uh, I generally feel like you want to encourage people to do this kind of stuff and you want them to have their own collections. Um, depending on your org and whether you can, like, uh, so one of the things that we did is when we looked to beef up the data team, we hired analysts to pair with different parts of the organization. So we had an analyst to pair with marketing, we had an analyst to pair with, um, you know, one or two product pods. And so we wanted to enable the PMs or marketers to go and build their own reports in MetaBase, but we also had, we identified someone that who was responsible for helping those, those, those teams. And so I think you want to help people create lots of stuff, but again, you want to just make sure that they're using the, the like official designated model as much as possible. Um, and, um, um, that's another shout out for just looking like maybe if you have a thousand people in your organization, you have different people responsible to different functions, they could look at all the questions being created by different people and just try and get a sense of what are people looking at? What are new models that we should be creating? And how do I just make sure that, you know, the last thing you want is marketing and finance to be using two different data sets that have conflicting information. Marketing says, look, our, our, our ads are profitable and finance saying, nope. Your payback's too long, and it's you know your your CAC is higher than your the LTV, and like uh, the last thing you want is that kind of a situation. And so I think you want to just be able to understand, have people working with those different functions, understand what's top of mind for them, monitor the types of questions they're looking at, so they have a sense of what's important and what's critical and top of mind, and so they can either proactively reach out um, to help, or they're just plugged into that work stream and they can help give advice as um, it's ongoing. But other, you know, other than that, as long as they're building on an official blessed model, I wouldn't, 
I would encourage lots of people to create lots of questions. Yeah, I would just add to that as well. Um, just give a shout out to one of our pro and enterprise features, uh, which allow you to mark certain um, questions um, as verified and, and moderated. Um, you can also do that with collections and models as well, um, just to make sure that people are using sort of a, um, a vetted data source um, or question. Cool. So I think that pretty much takes us up to the hour. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, sorry if we didn't get to, to all your questions or comments there. Um, but thank you so much for joining. Um, and thank you for all the questions. It was um, clearly a very interesting session since people had so many, so many things that they wanted to ask you, Dan. So thank you so much for, for being part of it and for presenting and yeah. Happy to, happy to share anything. If, any, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to email me. I'm Dan at Reforge. And uh, also go check out uh, Artifacts by Reforge. I go into a bunch of these. These You can see the revenue dashboard. You can see our data diagram. Um, all these things uh, are on uh, Reforge. Cool. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, great. Well, we'll see you at the next one. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jess. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.